All right. All right, guys, welcome to Get to Know Your Olympus Educators. My name is Lee Hoy, and we've got a panel, as you might see there on your screen, with some images. Nothing like technical people having technical issues. So some people you may hear, some you may see, some you may hear and see for a while, and then some may disappear. So unfortunately, we've had a couple with slower internet that aren't able to join us this evening, but we think that over the next, I believe, hour and a half, you're going to get a chance to get to know as many of the Olympus educators as technology will allow. So uh, my name is Lee Boy, uh, and I'm going to walk you through and introduce you to each of our Olympus educators. There's 19 different ones. Not all are able to be with us tonight. We all have different photography genres, specialties, uh, skills, what we do. And we want to do this workshop because I think, particularly if you're an Olympus shooter, and if you're not, we know you soon will be, but we think that you will benefit by getting to know these individuals because I've only known them for about a month and a half. And there are some amazing photographers, some awesome personalities. We've been getting together once a week, having a blast. And if you get a chance so far to go on a workshop, to have your image taken by any of these photographers, you'll be making a great decision. I've been having a ball getting to know them and I know you will too. So having said that, I'm going to switch our screen now from our mugs uh, although some of them look actually really good tonight compared to what we normally look like. Um, I want to show you some of their pictures and I am going to introduce you to some of their work and then they're going to introduce and tell you a little bit. Whoops. Well, of course, our slide starts right at the wrong one beginning. So James, not start there. But these images, we've got four from each photographer, even from some who couldn't be here tonight. So I want to start with Tom and Lisa. Now, they've been having some uh, they've been having some challenges tonight. And so while their images are up, we're going to see if they can speak to the microphone. You have a chat on the right and there's a QA. and a and Rob and some of the other photographers are going to keep an eye on that. So if we get some good questions, we hope you'll be willing to submit those as well. But Lisa, Tom, why don't you guys introduce yourself? Hi. So Hi. we Good are evening, here. Yes. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Um, we this first picture that's up kind of shows why we jumped uh, to Olympus is because of the live composite technology. For those of you that are using that technology with your Olympus cameras, you know that it's almost magical. Like you can actually see your image in the dark night develop you see the histogram move you see the light come in and when we saw that it was like literally magical to us and we we're like wow we got to investigate this and it was just something that we do a lot of night photography we do a lot of light painting and it was the main reason that we decided to uh, go on to and, and be part of the olympus family here well uh, this is a shot we took out in nevada we i, I love this shot i worked it for about 20 minutes uh, again, like Lisa said, this is uh, one of the reasons why we like our Olympus. I was able to start at the way, way in the back and uh, work my way forward towards the camera. And uh, after each truck, I evaluated the quality of light that I wanted to put on uh, a particular truck and so forth. And towards the end, I realized I skipped a spot and, and I had to go back. And I, I did this all in one shot. Um, so we lead a lot of workshops and this like kind of shows that we're pretty eclectic. If you go onto our website, uh, our website, you see that we have a portrait studio. We own a whole bunch of frogs. We do landscape photography. We do animal photography, a lot of night photography. You'll even see a doorknob in there that looks like a face. So we do something called paradoia where you can go around. So let's say you show up at a national park and it's closed. What do you do? We're going to still find a really good shot by taking you to a junkyard. And we're going to have just as much fun in the junkyard as we're going to have as if we could get into whatever beautiful national park. So this like kind of represents us pretty well in that you can see we have our hands in a little bit of everything um, and we also um, have a portrait studio and we teach workshops for photography and photoshop and things like that there as well and and that's how they got their olympus equipment was by taking people to junkyards in the middle of the night so <laughs> <laughs> Um, so focus stacking was something before I was an Olympus user that I kind of always was enamored with. I would take a few pictures and get the macro uh, rail out and then they would just sit in my computer and every once in a while I'd have a little free time and play with it. But this shot slide really shows what you can do with focus stacking in camera. So the left picture shows, you know, wide open. 
the whole flower isn't in focus, but the background's really beautiful. And we get asked the question a lot when we show a, 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 at a presentation and they say, well, why not just stop down to F22? Well, you could do that, but now your background sucks. So what focus stacking in camera does is it basically takes a picture, refocuses, moves, takes a picture, refocuses and moves. And you get this beautiful image that's completely in focus, whether it's a landscape, whether it is a um, you know, a bug, whether it's a flower, and then you get a beautiful background with it. So we do a lot of, you know, showing people how they can take the best pictures possible, whether they're using Olympus camera um, and lenses or not. But with the Olympus technology, it kind of sells itself because you show people, hey, I can stack stars in camera. I can do live time in camera. I can focus stack in camera. And you don't have to hard sell anything because the technology is just amazing and it kind of wows people. So uh, we did get a question of, can you focus stack with the Mark V? Yes, you can. So we do, I own a uh, EM5 uh, Mark III. I assume that's what that means by that. And uh, yes, you can do that with, uh, with that camera as well. Cool. All right, thanks guys. And next up is the very dignified Joseph Mark photography. We, uh, we like uh, to look at his photos because as you're gonna see, uh, for those of us that can't photograph people, he shows you how it's done. <laughs> well, I guess that's right. I, I guess about 98% of my photographs uh, have people in them. I switched to the Olympus camera system full time, I think, when the EM1 Mark II came out. So I was that three years or four years ago. I don't know, it was a while back. Um, I really, you know, it's, it's the simple stuff for me. Um, you know, the portability of the system, the very angle screen, the being able to see through the camera, the exposure you're about to make, those were the really huge advantages that for me in the Olympus camera system for shooting weddings. Um, this one is a great example. I was watching this. They got married off to the left, and I was watching the sunset go down to the right. And if you guys are, especially if you're in nature and wildlife photography, you guys know how fast this goes, right? So I'm like, dear God, please <laughs> let them get done with the ceremony in time to make a photograph. And this was made uh, at 10 seconds after they got married. And thankfully, because um, you know I had the camera on me, and I could see the exposure through the camera. I wasn't guessing. I wasn't waiting to make this kind of picture. And, and that's what I love about the most. Um, this is uh, about a portrait made here in Dallas, Texas, where I've been shooting weddings for the last 18 years. And uh, this Millennium Falcon room is a pretty famous one here. Uh, this one you'll notice was taken with a camera above my head. And you know, precise framing and focus when the camera's not up to your eye is a huge win for weddings and portraits and event photography. And this last one here is actually a family portrait. I have a... Um, a pretty thriving business here shooting families and I do about 50 or 60 of them a year and I always tell people if you're getting into doing family portraiture you've got to show people what they're actually buying and a lot of the time um, you know I want to show them that these cameras can produce these beautiful wall portraits and wall portraits is really what I want to sell to people and so uh, instead of just showing the images by themselves I like to show them in the environment in which they'll actually be and so this is an example of that. And again, this is just kids in the studio playing around, doing some double exposure work. And uh, like I said, I just, uh, I love the speed. I love the um, uh, quickness of using the camera. I use it in the studio, I lose it on location, and it's just a brilliant tool. All right, thank you, sir. And next up, we have Stan Foxworthy, and uh, he has got some very snazzy looking photos he wants to share with you. Oh, that knucklehead. Uh, yeah, I'm Stan Foxworthy with Foxworthy Studios. Uh, I started my career in 1976 as a photojournalist, and I've been a professional photographer ever since. Uh, what I love about what I use, and I can use anything, and I've used everything from 8x10 cameras to me medium format, you name it, and I like the fact that I can just create and I don't have to worry about it, and everything turns out exactly the way I want it to look. Plays well with lighting. Uh, this was actually a six light photo shoot for a CEO of four companies. Uh, and this was actually also a men's journal magazine. Uh, it just makes it so easy. And at, at my age, I don't want to have to manual focus anymore. I don't want to have to worry about it. And doggone it, the stuff works beautifully. And sometimes I do some something off the, off the cuff with... Uh, this is a comedian here in Charleston, South Carolina. We had to do something just a little bit different. Uh, the files are beautiful. I, I do theatrical portraiture. I specialize also in motorsports 
anything for advertising, marketing, commercial, and we also have Cunning Fox Photo Education, where we put on workshops around the country, as well as photo talks. This is part of a project we're doing down in uh, Havana. Uh, we're doing it in Havana and uh, Vanales in Cuba for their th uh, 500th anniversary. I was down there in December 4. So again, I'm hand holding it an eighth of a second. It looks beautiful. Motorsports. This has got to be one of the easiest setups to use for motorsports for panning. The logos the on the EM1X, it focuses on the helmet. It knows what a car looks like. Uh, the autofocus is phenomenal. As I said, I'm tired of manually focusing anymore. And for my clients, like Michelin and others, they want to see their logo. It doesn't matter what everything else is going. If you can't get a sharp shot of the car and the logo, they're not going to. All right. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to head on next. We have Steve and Faith hey, you. Hutchison and with up, their – oh. Sorry, we got a little audio. I think. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Faith Hutchinson are with our photo tribe. Hello. Stephen Faith, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, King Bay. I don't know if their audio is working, guys. King Bay, verify for me. Stephen Faith, you there? Uh, well, I'll show you some of their pictures. Their website is Our Photo Tribe. You can see right there, they live in Florida. They do a lot of weekend type workshops, uh, single day training. They work in a camera store in Florida. Hopefully, they'll be able to hop in here in a minute and be able to share. But here's a few of their images, which are really cool. Got the sax player. And then they took advantage of, as so, several others have mentioned, of the, uh, the live composite feature in the Olympus cameras. Here's one of their shots. And then here's a really nice butterfly shot. In, are you guys there yet? Oh, that's too bad. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully we can get their audio back up for you here in a minute. But again, ourphototribe.com. And you can go and learn a little bit more about Stephen Faith. And hopefully they'll be able to jump in here in a minute. Um, so, and as I said, my name is Lee Hoy. I am uh, LeeHoyPhotography.com. Uh -oh. And uh, I'm a wildlife, landscape, night sky, and macro photographer based out near Big Bend National Park in West Texas. I also get to lead photography workshops for wild side nature tours. And Rob and I, who you'll meet here in a second, actually got to team up on our first one here in the Amazon, which was really cool. Um, Yellowstone in winter. I love macro, getting up close to wildlife. And then, of course, my home area of Big Bend National Park. So, so that's my my four photos there. Rob, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about what I don't know about you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know what that is at this point. But, um, <laughs> just a, a quick note too. If some of you guys know, there's a, a question. Um, Rudy wants to know if you can focus stack with the EM10 Mark II, and I haven't used that machine. So if anybody has experience with the EM10 and knows about focus stacking, jump on the Q and A and and uh, let him know. Um, yeah, my name's Rob Knight, and uh, I've been teaching photography for about 12 years now and um, using Micro Four Thirds cameras for nine of those years. And uh, the selection of, of images that I sent to Lee are, are ones that I basically couldn't have done unless I used an Olympus camera to make them. This shot in particular, Lee mentioned our trip to Peru in February uh, along the Amazon River. And this is a handheld high res shot with the uh, EM1 Mark III and having the flexibility to, to create that high resolution shot, great lenses like the seven to 14 millimeter uh, F28 Pro um, and that kind of thing, that, that makes a shot like this. You know, we we're walking on these rickety uh, catwalks along this pond in sort of the middle of nowhere. And with a bigger system, if I had to set up a tripod and all that stuff, this, this shot wouldn't happen. So, um, you know, I love the flexibility of the smaller gear to begin with, not to mention the high quality of the images. Oh, boy. This, so I lead workshops in uh, Costa Rica. I've been doing that for the last uh, 11 years. And um, one of the things that I love, everybody's mentioned the, the creativity of, the, you know, that the uh, uh, electronic viewfinder affords and the small size. Well, this is a great example of that. When our, my guide got a phone call and his eyes lit up that there was a puma in Carrera National Park. We just grabbed our gear and went. And I, I can 
um, hustle myself into the forest and get into almost any position with what is the equivalent of a 1200 millimeter lens. And the image stabilization works so well, I don't have to worry about a tripod and I can get uh, what, you know, could be once in a lifetime shots like this. And um, I mean, this is, that's the full frame. That's, um, you, you can still skip it, but um, without having to crop in, having that 1200 millimeter effective uh, range and a lens that's basically the size of a 70 to 200 is is fantastic so um, this is another shot that i wouldn't even have considered making without the olympus system and this is the the live composite and a couple of people we've seen some photos from the live composite so far but um this shot we were we were on the boat again in peru and our guide was acting as the the headlight and the land the uh, wildlife spotter for us and so i just opened the shutter with the live composite mode and to see what it would look like. And I got several amazing shots. This is the one that came out the best, but uh, I love having that technology built in to just be creative and play around and just kind of see what happens in a way that I, I mean, I guess I could have made this with a series of eight or 10 shots at long exposures and then blended them in Photoshop, but that wouldn't even have crossed my mind if I couldn't have done it in the camera. Um, this guy, this is another one in Peru. Uh, it, to me, this speaks to the, the, the sharpness of the Olympus system, the ease of use. Um, it's not some big thing that I have to set up. I can grab the nature shots. Um, I can get the, you know, this is almost like travel photography with a monkey in it. You know, this guy was, uh, I, he, he seemed like he really wanted to show us the main lodge that was decaying into the jungle, but he, he kept kind of coming over to us and then going and looking over his shoulder, like, come on, that's Let's check it out. You know, it's pretty cool. But uh, all right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. All right. Jamie McDonald, jmcdonaldphoto.com there. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jamie. Uh, sure thing. First, just want to say thanks for uh, assembling this panel. It's probably a pretty good idea or a pretty good opportunity for people who either aren't familiar with the Olympus system to get to hear more about what the system provides or for those that are in attendance that are Olympus users. It's a good way for them to get to know who they're um, who their resources are moving forward, I guess, with their Olympus equipment. Cause I think we're all probably pretty active on social media. I know uh, I field questions on and off all day long and I'm sure you guys do too as well. So again, thanks for hosting this Lee. Uh, Jamie McDonald, I uh, live here in Michigan. I've been shooting pretty much only Olympus cameras ever since day one. I got my first camera in 2007. It was an Olympus PSLR. And once I saw the original OMD EM5 announced, I pitched all my DSLR equipment and jumped right into mirrorless and haven't looked back since. I've uh, been a member of the Olympus Visionary Program and other programs that Olympus has had for like the last eight years now. Uh, also a podcast founder of the podcast Mirrorless Minutes, which has been running for about six years. Uh, about three years ago, started doing workshops as well. So I uh, don't do a lot of workshops every year. I'm not like you guys. My I actually have like a a nine to five day job in marketing. And so I just took my passion for photography and moved it out into starting to teach people photography. My typical genres are kind of tough to describe, but I pretty much tell people if it's outside of my front door, it's fair game. So it's everything from weather, uh, nature photography, macro, landscapes, you name it. Um, I'm even been known to as one of those, I think previous images shown, uh, dive into abandoned buildings in Detroit and other places throughout the country to do a little urban exploration as well. I won't spend a lot of time right now talking about the Olympus equipment. I think you guys have covered it like super well as far as the capabilities. And a lot of the imagery that you're showing here now is possible because of that, like this live composite shot along the shores of Lake Michigan. Uh, what you're looking at is about a 30 minute exposure done with live composite. You know, typically in the past, you know, this was, you can see by the light and the right hand side of the frame, this was started prior to sunset. So, um, you know, you can't really run a long exposure just before sunset for a half hour without blowing everything out. So you got to love what live composite provides uh, as far as opportunities go. Um, like I said, I shoot a lot of outdoor stuff. So using things like live composite come in really handy for storm chasing and fireworks, as well as astrophotography and light trails and things like that. Great. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Next up, they weren't able to join us because they live out in a very remote area and they don't have very strong internet service. But we have Joe and Marianne McDonald who've been in wildlife photography for over 30 years. They do workshops all over the world. Here's a beautiful shot uh, from South Texas of a painted bunny. Uh, here's a, a nice jaguar from uh, South America. 
They've got a, a cool little robber fly here getting in my realm, what I like to do. And then they got this really nice shot of a bear, but they have been going all over the world. You can see their website that we had up there and they do all kinds of workshops, great folks and very long time photographers, but unfortunately weren't able to join us this evening. So next up, I want to introduce John and Lisa Merrill. They are uh, Merrill Images and they have graciously donated a complete Olympus package to give away at the end of this. I don't know how big Tom T's and there's no big Olympus package to the end, but, but here, let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves. Hi, uh, we'll both say a, a little bit. I'm uh, just thrilled to be here tonight. Thanks, Lee, and uh, the talent that I'm loving seeing. We didn't know what, which images we'd each contribute, so this is a treat for uh, us as well. Uh, and I, I also will just acknowledge every everyone has their how they get to Olympus story. And for me, it had to do with wrist and forearm issues, seriously not enjoying photography with the gear we'd used for two decades. And, and it, but the fun factor and some of the stuff I couldn't have dreamed of when we switched five years ago is um, echoing uh, what, you know, all of these other photographers from frogs to city lights to abandoned places, we have a gamut. And John and I love to do travel and cultural photography, take small groups to places like Cuba, Vietnam, Ladakh. We've postponed all of our tours and we'll hope that travel becomes safe in the next year, 2021, and doing much more regional um, day, day workshops and weekends here in the Pacific Northwest. So thanks for having us and we can look at some images. There you go. Yeah. So this is a, um, a shot from Vietnam, one of the, one of the um, wonderful things about the tours we take is we there's a lot of serendipity going on. We were on the streets of Hanoi late at night and ran into this street performance and we're able to use the ambient, the lights that were on this stage to our advantage. You can see that even created some eye shine in this actor. And um, you know, one of the things that we often do is we find a great background and we wait for something to move in front of it. And that was the case here. Um, and um, this is another uh, so this is in Cuba we love you know we love to go to Cuba too and uh, we've gone there like what five times now leading tours and on our own and it's a wonderful place wonderful people can't wait to get back there and um, this is a wide angle shot from the inside of a cocoa taxi that kind of creates a frame and this just shows you how colorful and full of life uh, Cuba, Cuban streets are. Yeah, and you know, we, we, we give a lot of thought to how we travel and as travel photographers, we shoot a variety of architecture, lots of people, but you're walking for miles when it is an urban uh, day or, you know, different times. So that Coco Taxi is a hoop because we break into little groups of two and you get, you know, through the narrow streets with your camera, people are friendly and receptive, but it's kind of an interesting way to do photography and a lot of fun when you're tired to take an hour tour in these tiny little things and, you know, take, also take each other. But an, another Cuba shot here is the use of panning, which we love to do ourselves and we love to help others master it. It is a, a, requires some practice and patience, but to move your camera along with your subject and fuzz out a background with a slow shutter is great and we have in our cameras and other systems where you can set a group of um, settings to do this well and that would be a rapid burst uh, low shutter speed and continuous focus and it's really fun on any we do it in Seattle we practice on the neighbors with their you know scooters and bikes but uh, we, we think it's a fun technique to use to tell stories especially because life does have a lot of motion to it and yeah we've been doing this for years and um, the stabilization system and the olympus cameras and the autofocus make it a lot easier than it used to be i'll tell you it's, it's and Thanks, street Dad. photography the last thing i'll say is using live view and being able as to tilt it and see it lets you see what's coming. And it's it's uh, been interesting to experiment panning with live view, sometimes with the screen to, uh, articulated. So thanks for having us and we'll yeah. see who's next. All right. All right. Well, Eric's well, internet Eric's is not playing nice, playing nice. Uh, this evening. So we have got uh, some of his photos. You can see his website there. Eric leads workshops as well for Joseph Vano's photo safaris to exotic, wonderful destinations, beautiful shots of some puffins that he sent in and this hooded merganser, which is just a gorgeous shot that he 
sent in as well. He's got this nice close-up, intimate portrait of a bear. It makes you almost want to pet him, doesn't it? And then he sent in a really beautiful Rufus hummingbird. So Eric's got some spectacular work. Great guy. He's been with Joseph Anos for a very long time. And unfortunately, he couldn't be a part of us tonight. But if you go out and look at his website, you, you'll definitely see some spectacular work if you're thinking about going to some of those destinations. Uh, very soft-spoken, but very extremely knowledgeable photographer. So shame that his internet wasn't cooperating tonight. Next up, we have uh, Victor Rodriguez, photos by Victor. And as someone who doesn't do uh, portrait or, or people, all of our folks that are educators that do just do spectacular work in it. And it, it makes me think about how to make my photography better. So Victor, Victor's, uh, I don't know if his video is going to cooperate tonight, but his audio should be. So Victor, why don't you tell everybody about yourself? Hey everyone. Um, I'm Victor Rodriguez. I'm uh, from photography by Victor. Um, I also just tossed my website in the chat. Um, I kind of got my start with Olympus back in 2009, I want to say. Uh, it was actually through uh, the college, that the university I was attending at the time, University of the Arts. They wanted to do a launch thing with students. Um, and I was involved with that. Uh, they called me back to do a few things. And then from there, my first camera was uh, with Olympus was um, the E30 when they introduced all the uh, art filters and whatnot. Um, since then, I've been using Olympus. Um, uh, to shoot pretty much all my fashion portraits. Uh, I shoot product and food as well. Um, as is also um, kind of more black and white uh, fine art stuff. And occasionally I do cityscapes with my friends uh, just to kind of kill time when I when I have free time. Um, next, I, I, I don't really do workshops, but I also, but I teach at uh, Rowan College in New Jersey. Um, so, I teach uh, uh, black, uh, studio and portrait photography there. All right. Thanks, Victor. Appreciate you sharing. Next up this evening, we have Matt Seuss, no relation, I inquired. And he is going to tell you a little bit about what he does. You see his website over there on the left. And he's going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his photography. Hey guys, uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, Lee, thank you for putting this all together and thanks all the fellow Olympus educators for coming together and uh, sharing what we do. Um, I think you, everyone watching here kind of understands that we have a love for education, obviously, and we love sharing what we do and what we've learned and trying to help you guys out with your Olympus cameras as well. And I started with Olympus, actually the very first camera I purchased on my own, it was in the mid eighties and that was an Olympus OMG film camera. And uh, also had an Olympus stylus camera, a uh, little point and shoot. I actually still have a roll of film in it that <laughs> is probably from like about 15 or 20 years ago that I, I have no idea what's on it. I may have to develop that one day. But uh, like Stan, I was a photojournalist. And so I've been a professional photographer for 30 years. And I started as a photojournalist for 17 years. And I was shooting with Nikon and Canon most of the time through that. And then moved out west to do fine art landscape photography and also education. And I was most recently switching or sh shooting with Sony cameras and ended up switching to Olympus just over a year ago. I got my hands on the EM1X and tried that out for a little while. And I had a uh, two month loaner from Olympus and uh, it, it just blew my mind. Um, I was um, just amazed at what I could do creatively or creatively. Uh, and I, I think Rob mentioned that he had some shots that he never could have gotten without an Olympus camera. And same thing with me. It just opened up my world of photography. And this is after being a professional now for you know almost 30 years at this point, where just having the Olympus cameras just opened up so many new avenues for, uh, for photography for me. And I don't know, I think uh, you're just looking at a photo um, of the uh, star trails with a uh, live comp on that. Um, but yeah, actually leave that next shot there if you see me in the live video, I have a print of this that's uh, 60, 64 inches, something like that uh, behind me right now in my home studio, acrylic print. And I don't know if people say that you can't do large prints with micro four thirds cameras. I, I don't know what's going on. You're just listening to the full frame hype too much. I, and this, this print is just absolutely gorgeous. So don't be afraid to be doing 
large prints with your Olympus cameras. And so I now specialize in landscape photography, astrophotography, and also macro photography. And this is a fun shot I did maybe about a month ago. Uh, this is a close up of a uh, a soap bubble as it was freezing. Uh, we, I was fortunate to, um, I was in Arizona for most of the winter, but got back home to Bozeman, Montana, and we had a little bit of a cold spell a month ago, and the temperatures were in the teens, and I was out there with uh, with UV lights, and uh, in my, um, I think this was probably with the uh, MZUICO 60 millimeter macro lens, and with the Mark III camera, and uh, just getting some really cool close-ups of the ice crystals forming on a soap bubble. And, you know, this is something I never could have done with another camera. Uh, I also shoot wildlife now that I've been up in Montana for a number of years. Uh, this was outside of Bozeman, Montana about a year ago with the uh, 300 F4 and probably the 1.4 teleconverter too. And I really like trying to get, you know, not just, you know, trying to elevate the my, my own personal wildlife photography and trying to show them in their environment and, you know, just really you know, like this photo here, I, I always wanted to get a photo of a bison in, in the snow. And again, coming back from Arizona over the winter that I spent last year, we had a nice snowfall. I knew where there's some bison. And I mean, I had an idea on this image for a long time and I was just so excited to get this, to show this bison, just some of the conditions that they have to go through in the middle of the winter. I mean, just an amazing animal. And I was lucky enough to uh, find it under perfect conditions and have the right gear to uh, be able to shoot out in the snow and not worry about getting cameras wet or anything like that. All right, cool. Thanks, Matt. And last but not least is the lady who does not like computers, but has to use them for a job. And here we go, Lydra Davis <laughs> Woodley, the anti-computerist. Please share. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I'm Lydra Woodley, and I am the owner of Natural Connections Photo Workshops. Basically, what I do is I take people to really awesome places. I get them to the right place at the right time of day. I help them get the shot if they need it. And overall, it's just a whole lot of fun. It's the best job ever. So um, I switched to Olympus about 10 minutes after I held uh, EM5 original. I never went back to my DSLR equipment, and I have been shooting since 2012 uh, with Olympus. And the thing I really, really like about it the most is because I'm hands-on with the workshops. Um, struggling with all this pro DSLR gear just doesn't work for me. I also don't like to set up and really do my own shooting during my workshops. So I now have a system where it's so light and easy that I can just take a shot here or there and not actually have to be set up. Um, this guy here, this is one of my um, wildlife shots that I never used to shoot wildlife um, until I got a the system. I wasn't about to spend $12,000 on a long lens that weighed 50 pounds and all of that kind of stuff. So um, now I actually will shoot wildlife and that's thanks to Olympus just existing with their mirrorless system. So it helps me a lot on my workshops. Plus you're, you're talking about being in conditions like this with this guy, um, you know, the uh, cold weather ability with these cameras is just amazing. And uh, is there another picture or is it stuck? <laughs> No, it's there. The flower shot. Your oh, flower shot. thank you. I'm not seeing it. And uh, so I tried to submit some images that kind of show you a sort of a, you know, variety of what I kind of do. This is um, this is the Olympus 60 macro. And um, I just think this is such a beautiful lens. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it has great bokeh. It's just um, it's stunning because I like to do the kind of um, macro stuff that is more of a the soft look to everything. I don't do a lot of focus stacking or anything like that. I love my 2.8 lenses to do macro. So, you know, that's just an example of, uh, actually that was an example during a bad rainy day on one of my workshops, we had to uh, pull an audible and we ended up at a gardens. <laughs> so, so I got that from rain. And then this guy here, this is actually one of my favorite shots that um, ever has come out of arches for me anyway. Um, it's really, it's really amazing. And, um, this is actually an HDR shot that, um, we had really great sky, but we had a lot of shadow, um, of parts of the, the, the monument there and, um, HDR just really, really works. I do a lot of HDR work with this camera. Um, and I do a lot of handheld. This was probably set up on a tripod, but I've actually been doing more and more handheld work as this, these cameras have evolved the image stabilization system has just gotten so much better and you will see me doing a lot of handheld work with HDR. And again, that's one of those things that's not possible um, without Olympus cameras, at least for me. So, 
Um, I'm going to actually put up, I think I just put up my website on the chat and uh, yeah, I'd love to see any of y'all if you have questions about uh, workshops. All right, guys, I'm going to now let you get to know these folks a little bit more. I've created some questions. They have not seen them. They can verify that. And I'm going to skip around and, and ask some questions of our different educators. And so to start first, Mr. Rob Nye, what you may not know is Rob was a former tattoo artist. So, Rob, how does your past life as a tattoo artist, in, how is it informed and influenced your photography? Well, I think um, I think Lydra's shot from Arches is integral <laughs> to my answer. Yeah, um, let's jump back in. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, well, I always say that that anything you learn about art um, helps every bit of art that you do. So, spending um, twenty five years as a full time, uh, basically commercial artist, uh, just using different tools that a lot of people use, you know that that helps uh, whether it's uh, talking about color relationships, whether it's talking about composition, you know, we photographers didn't invent composition, right? For, so all of that goes into whether you're designing a tattoo or designing a web page or, you know, uh, just making a painting or making a photograph that um, I think the sort of knack that I have for composition, one of the reasons I got into photography in the first place 20 years ago was because I was traveling for tattoo conventions and taking pictures as you know where I went. So I realized that I remember uh, seeing a calendar uh, that came to the tattoo shop, as a matter of fact, and I, and I kind of freaked out because I was like, where did they get my photo from Lake Tahoe? And the guys in the shop were like, that's not true. I'm like, dude, and I pulled out the picture and I was standing in exactly the same place at composed the frame exactly like this professional photograph. I'm like, well, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, that's something I should look into. And um, so that, uh, I, like I said, just the knack for, for visually organizing things, um, I think came from my art background for sure. Cool. Thank you, man. All right, Stan, are you still with us, Stan? I don't see his name over on the list, so we may have lost Stan. I don't hear him, so I'm going to jump over. Jamie? You got oh, you good? Can you hear me? I'm, All right, I'm Jamie, good. First question. If you had to go out for one week shooting with only one Olympus body and lens, what would it be and why? EM1X 12 to 100. And why? Uh, the versatility of that 12 to 100 is amazing. Couple that with the EM1X and image stabilization working together. Uh, you can shoot dust to dawn handheld and not worry about any kind of shake i'm not an old old guy but i'm not a spring chicken so i get a little bit wobbly after a long day of shooting and having that image stabilization certainly helps uh the em1x uh the speed of focus on that and a long day of shooting it might go from landscape to wildlife and being able to track objects in motion with the em1x is an astounding thing to be able to do and uh, i just like the form factor of the em1x it's funny a lot of people transition away from a DSLR to the mirrorless systems to go smaller. And I can appreciate that. And I pack a separate bag that way for travel. But if I'm going to be out all day, I tend to pack the larger camera just for the balance of like the 300 on it and the 12 to 100 and the seven to 14. But if I need to pack lighter for travel, then I'll throw like an EM5 Mark three on there. And then the 1.8 primes and the 60 mil macro or something like that to travel light with. But that's my combo, man. EM1X, 12100. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, Faith and Steve, can you guys unmute your mic? Because I've got a question for you. So here's your first question. Okay. You guys have been posting a series of images with the hashtag gratitude 30 photos of late. Yes. Why do you think gratitude is such an important feature as a photographer? Um, well, it, it was kind of speaking to, and I know Jamie was doing a, a segment about it too, the current crisis. So it it's, can be stressful. Uh, it can be easy to look at all the things that are going wrong. Um, and another hashtag that we used with that is interrupt anxiety with gratitude. So take the positive things and try and focus on those instead of considering all the things that are going wrong. So um, we've tried to kind of portray some of the things and some were silly um, and some were genuine. Um, 
which is kind of accurate to us. Um, for the group that's here, um, we've been speaking with all of you for the past month or so, and and we, we can be really silly, uh, but this is something that I, I uh, felt strongly about with, with all of the concern that everyone has, all the stress everyone has. Cool, all right, thanks guys. Thank right, you. Tom and Lisa, you're up. So you guys have been posting and photographing flowers in a very creative fashion of late, and all of them were taken inside your home. Why is this form of photography so often overlooked, yet it offers a tremendous opportunity for real creativity? Nope. Is your mic on, Lisa? All right, guys, keep working on your mic. Keep, we'll see if we can get your – you've got two of your mics are muted, so you may need to test them. I'm going to jump to another question. You keep working on it and see if we can get your volume back. So then we'll go to another Lisa, John and Lisa Merrill here. What was an aha moment for each of you where you felt your photography jumped to the next level in terms of excellence? Sorry, could you repeat the first what was an aha moment for each of you where you felt your photography jump to the next level in terms of excellence? Uh, you go first. <laughs> Let's see. Well, uh, when we were, um, when we were young, before we had kids, we um, took a year off. We bought one of these around the world tickets and We took off um, for a, a year, literally a year, and we took, this was back in film days, we took 500 rolls of film with us. And the aha for me during that trip was being able, having the time to slow down and really make connections with people we were photographing was for me a, a huge leap because all of a sudden um, we were getting really, really great photographs um, of people and places that you, we just couldn't get if we were rushing through, um, you know, our, our shoots and our times. And it was wonderful. It was really great. And also making connections with people that were really meaningful. Go ahead, Lisa. You know, we can talk as much as we all want about bits and bytes and lenses, but for, especially with travel, and we have a lot of time, or you have a little time treating everyone with respect, whether family members, anyone, and, and developing the rapport is going to take your people photography a long way, much than when all the Oh, you're skipping out a little bit, I think. Aren't you? I, have ever, and I remember I was thinking back, and it was film days with a one year old on my back at a powwow and getting some motion of the powwow and, you know, and slides, seeing that. And now it is easier and still a delight. And when we do any kind of motion, traffic, dancers, kids on bicycles, we, we like freezing and sometimes panning and blur, and it's endlessly fun. And then there's intentional camera, a swirl of a mountain and a sunset. And I thought, you know, once in a while, just play. It is just a delight. So uh, we're still learning and it's a, a great group to be part of. And I'm just grateful for you, Lee, for the way your, your questions are going. They're good. Let's keep, let's hear some good. more. Thank you. All right, Joseph, are you there? Can you hear us? Joe? I see him up, but I'm not hearing him. Anybody hearing Joe? No. Okay. I'll come back to Joe here in a minute. All right, leader, since you can hear me on your website, natural connections photo, you have a wide variety of genres of photography that you teach such as landscapes, holiday lights, old car city, a fair and the Oregon coast to name a few. If you had to pick two of those that you would do for the rest of your life, 
even if you had another, never had another client, which two would you pick? Mm, I'm the landscape girl at heart. That's how I got into this. Um, Glacier National Park and probably Oregon Coast. Um, anything, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I love doing the abstracts. I love doing other things that are different and fun. One night, fair and that sort of thing. But the heart of what I do is landscape and travel. So you can't pin me down. I have to travel <laughs> and I want to go to pretty places. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Victor. All right, Victor, you're up, sir. On your website, photobyvictor.com, you have some standard categories in your portfolio like editorial, food, and product, but there's one that isn't really standard, and that is called personal. What separates these images from all the all the rest, and what does it say about you as an artist? Nope, oh, your your mic is. Let me unmute you, Vic. You there, Victor? Hello. Yeah. Did you, right. you get the question? <laughs> yeah, I got the question. Okay. Um, so yeah, my personal work, uh, what's separate from that is it's just usually things that I do um, like as ideas or kind of like templates or whatever um, that isn't something that I've been hired to do. So there's just projects that I start on my own. Um, and, and, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff scattered throughout my entire website that's just personal work, that, uh, but I just kind of mix them. The The ones that are series are the ones that I put specifically over there. Um, and I guess as far as what it says about me as an artist is that I'm, I'm always thinking about creating. Um, I'm always uh, con like coming up with different concepts, ideas of things I would like to do. Um, and sometimes if, I think of a new lighting that I want to try. Um, I'll usually do it, uh, set up something like that. So most of that work is just kind of speaks to me constantly like trying to uh, get ideas uh, out of my head and in front of, uh, in my studio, in front of my camera. Um, so that's, that's mostly what all that personal work is about. Okay, cool. Thanks, Victor. All right, Matt. You have an affinity for the technical side of photography and your Olympus equipment. How does the technical and gear side of photography help shape your final images? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, photography, you can really break it down into the basics. You don't need to have all the technical, as long as you know f-stops, shutter speeds, and ISO, and you know, just shooting in manual, you can keep it simple. Um, and you know, I do encourage my students to do that. You know, once you start getting a grasp for that, the, the technical abilities of the system um, are really exciting for me and being able to shoot tethered with the Olympus workspace, uh, shoot right directly to my computer, even shoot wirelessly. Uh, I was on a commercial shoot, <coughs> excuse me, commercial shoot last year where I had the EM1X and I was wirelessly uh, sending images live to the iPad to let the uh, clients look at the images and look at the scene, make sure the talent was in the right place, make sure the lighting was in the right place. Um, you know, so there's really cool benefits to the system for helping you really get the shot at that point. Um, you know, more technical things like live composition, being able to do star trails and um, not blow out highlights. Um, I'm using that now in the home studio. Um, I'm going to be having some things on Olympus. I'm going to be doing Olympus takeover on Instagram coming soon. I'm going to show some really cool things on what I'm doing with live comp in the home studio for macro photography that almost anyone can do just with some simple lights. Uh, you know, the focus stacking, the, um, I mean, there's, Again, there, you know, there's there's so many technical cool technical things that you can almost get lost, especially if you're you know a beginning photographer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for those that are just starting out, you know, just remember to learn the basics and learn that there's a lot of room to grow in the Olympus system, and there's a lot of cool technology that's in there that just is not available in any other camera platform that you can then start experimenting with and you know learn from learn from us, learn from, you know, my fellow Olympus educators. And, you know, because, you know, I'm not the only one that's having all this fun with the technical stuff. Um, you know, a lot of us are making some really great images and, uh, you know, just learn to have fun with the camera and 
take the technology, don't use it as a crux, use it as a uh, outlet for more creativity and just have fun with the photos. Cool. Thank you, sir. That, that right, segues so really great into my question for Lee Hoy, since he's been our master of ceremonies. <laughs> um, speaking of technical photography, you do a lot of um, really specialized technical photography with the high speed uh, flash, like building a little what is effectively a little set and having bugs fly around and using different you know triggers and that kind of thing. Um, what got you into that very specific genre of photography and how does how does that technology inspire your work? Thank you. That's a good one. I like to constantly learn. Both my parents were educators. And so, but I did not want to teach because I am not a small child fan in terms of being in the classroom with 30 of them. So how can I allow that educational background out? I love to photograph landscape and wildlife, but I constantly have to be pushing myself to learn something new. And some friends of mine who do uh, workshops related to bug shot uh, workshops, uh, John and Kendra Abbott, who were right, rewriting the Peterson Field Guide to Insects. I saw their shots of insects in flight, beetles, wasps, and I went, oh, like it's one thing to photograph a butterfly sitting on a flower. That's tough. That's hard. But when you see a picture of the wings open and it's frozen and you can really study that subject in, in flight like that, that was mind boggling to me. I've seen images of, you know, uh, bullets going through apples and balloons bursting. And that's cool. But I'm all about the natural world. And so when I see something that I can't see with my own eye and that image freezes it so that we can really appreciate that creature in its world, phew, Man, and, and that when you hear that system, like you put the bug in the fly box and then I hear a click when it goes to the laser, click, 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 man, your heart's going because you can't see the result for a while. You don't know if you got it or not. And sure enough, sometimes it's halfway on, like there'll be a perfect pose halfway on the screen and you're like, oh, and then you flip three ahead and then there's one, the wings are spread. It's like he's smiling at you like, oh, yeah. So. I love sometimes instant results, which we all get with our Olympus equipment. We get the results before we take the picture with Olympus. So I get stoked seeing something like that that I can't see any other way with my own naked eye. So thanks, Rob. Cool. I'm going to go to Joe because I know, Joe, if you can hear us and we can't hear you, type your answer because all the all of our viewers can then at least read it. So same thing, Tom and Lisa, when I ask you another question, just type your answer up so that people can see it. And Joe, I want you to type in your, oh, he's got a nasty little red exclamation point next to his name, which means he's probably not hearing me right now. But Tom and Lisa, I bet you can hear me. I dialed in, so I don't so, know if you can hear me now. Uh, I want you to, can y'all hear me? Can y'all speak? Yes, um, I can see, but I'm on my phone. No, okay, so go ahead and so. type your answer to this question, okay? What is an image that you have pre-visualized but have not yet had the chance to capture it? What Olympus gear are you going to use to capture it when you get a chance? I'll repeat it since you got to type your answer. What is an image that you have pre-visualized but have not yet had the chance to capture it? What Olympus gear are you going to use to capture it and how? So if you guys will type that up for folks, then that will always be in there for them as well. And now I'm going to jump to Rob, back to Rob. Rob, you recently took a large media group to Costa Rica for Olympus to demonstrate and allow them to experience the new Olympus OMD E M1 Mark III. Whenever someone is holding a new Olympus body, lens, or accessory in their hand, what are some tips you would give them for being able to get the most out of that piece of equipment? Well, that's a good question. Um... One of the challenges with with a group like that, especially these are you know generally experienced photographers, is to steer them towards things that work really well, that will give them a good impression, right? Um, one of, in order to do that, you have to basically steer people away from the focus tracking. That's that's the first thing I would do if you're going to shoot you know wildlife, um, any moving subject, you would think, okay, I'm going to put on continuous autofocus plus tracking because I want to track the subject, but it, it just doesn't work that well. It doesn't work as well as the regular continuous autofocus with a wide enough range of focus points. Uh, the predictive autofocus works beautifully. The tracking autofocus is not effective in, in any place that I've ever tried to use it. 
um, that was the biggest feedback that I had to keep reminding people. They're like, yeah, it's just not track and focus. And I would say, well, are you using the tracking or the continuous autofocus? They're all well, the tracking. I'm like, turn that off right now. It's like, don't do that. And uh, the next day, I had, there was a couple of guys I had to, like three different times. They're like, yeah, the tracking doesn't work. I'm like, no, the tracking doesn't work as well as the regular continuous autofocus. And I think we can all attest to how well the regular continuous autofocus works. Um, that's that's the biggest thing that jumps out. And um, I, to to continue what Matt says, the bells and the whistles in these cameras are amazing. And as professional photographers with experience, we all get a lot out of those tools. But if you don't know aperture, shutter speed, ISO, basic composition, then all the bells and whistles in the world aren't going to help you. If anything, it's just going to confuse the situation. So um, it's still about light and exposure. Um, and then we can use these great tools to do other crazy things with that. But you really need to understand light and exposure with any camera. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to ask one of our other Olympus educators, since Joseph's having issues, obviously. Joe has a phenomenal YouTube channel with lots of great tips on Olympus equipment, not, and it's not just about wedding photography. I mean, regardless of your kind of photography, you will learn something from his video. So if one of my other Olympus educators would take a second and post the link to Joe's YouTube channel, since he can't answer that question. Uh, and Joe, if you're hearing me, the question would be uh, related to your, your uh, YouTube channel. You have a very active YouTube channel with all kinds of information about Olympus cameras and portrait, family and wedding photography. When you're working on designing a video, what motivates you to help others to improve their photography? So if you can hear us type that answer down there, but if one of my Olympus educators would throw the link to his YouTube channel up there, that would be awesome. Faith and Steve, I'm going to jump back to you. So if you'll unmute your microphone there. So I, I find this very interesting because not only do both of you work at Johnson Photo Imaging Camera Store, and you also own our Photo Tribe workshops, how has photographing together as a couple shaped your photography style? Well, I'll let you speak to that one. Oh, uh, well, it's not a competition. So I think a lot of times we're, we could be shooting the same event then we come back and look at them and we're like, I didn't see that, you know, how, where was that? And it's like, Oh, it's right there. We, we shoot differently, but we still shoot together all the time. So it's surprisingly not a competition. You know, I don't think it ever is. John's nodding along. I, I think they probably experienced the yeah. same thing, which is we see different elements in the same scene. So Steve might be using the telephoto lens in, in a landscape situation, or I might be using a wide angle lens in the same scene. We just pick out different elements from exactly. standing in the same place and it becomes an entirely different perspective. So um, what the images we show on our website is actually, um, we alternate Makes whose sense. images is whose. And honestly, um, sometimes after editing a stack of photos, I really don't know anymore because um, we, we, you know, we're standing in the same place. Um, but it really comes to a different of, of um, just a different viewpoint, um, but but um, similar interests. That's cool. That's cool. And yeah, I've always that's I'll always add, been very fascinating. The other thing I'll add to that is, you know, looking at each other's images after is to me like an endless photo workshop. And I encourage people to just find a photo buddy, whether it's a partner, spouse, or anyone and do it online virtually if you need to. There's a lot of photo sharing groups and I think more during this crisis, but even with a one-on-one -on -one friend to go back and forth and ask, we ask our son who's an awesome photographer, which one should we post on Instagram today? It's really nice to share images with anyone and it doesn't have to be on a tour or workshop especially with uh, the ability to grab and share a screen the, the other thing that's really great about working with a team is you, you can help edit each other's stuff you know and be like really great oh, yeah. editing buddies that's cool that's great thank you guys that's really cool yeah but at the end of the day it's still two different styles we she shoots differently than i do so no matter what uh it's always entertaining to see even though I was there, I thought I took them all. I see ones that she's taken that I never saw. You know, I'm like, oh, the next time I, I'll steal that idea. But you know, she still masters it on her side. So. Definitely, <laughs> that's cool. 
All right. Thanks, guys. I like that one. And I'll copy guys, it. I, I won't steal. I've it. got to sign off and put my kids to bed. Um, thanks so much for having me. And, uh, right. Good night, Rob. We'll I'll see take you care, Rob. Thank thanks for having me, Rob. Good Rob. to see you. Good night. Jamie, you're up next. All right. What is a typical rule of photography you generally adhere to? And what is one that you tend to ignore or break the most? Uh, one that I adhere to, don't get arrested. One that I break <laughs> often is the rule of thirds. <laughs> I don't I don't have a rule that I adhere to. I, I don't think the rules are guidelines, you know, and I like to stay right on the edges of those guidelines. And then I like to stray out of those. Um, I went through a period where a lot of my landscape photography was in portrait orientation uh, and just started telling people I'm the landscape photographer who shoots portrait orientation all the time. I like to skew my images and give people a sliver of landscape and a massive impressive sky if the weather's appropriate for it, or I'll skew it the other way where the, if the sky isn't that great, I'll just give them a long leading foreground leading off into the distance, you know, with a focal point out there somewhere. But as far as rules go, I just think that they're a guideline and I don't really adhere to rules. Cool. All right. Thank you. We right, might later. be back. Ready? I'm not sure if anybody can hear us. <laughs> what is the best piece of advice you were ever given when it came to furthering your photography skill and knowledge? Who is that to? You. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thought you said me. <laughs> uh, you know, just you can't put the camera on the shelf. You've got to be constantly out there shooting and trying things. It's really helpful to read books about, you know, technique and that sort of thing. And studying other people's images helps a lot and picking them apart, figuring out how they got that result. Um, but I think it's just mostly important to just don't stop shooting because you start to develop your own technique and, um, and you just learn from that. Uh, but yeah, you're never going to get better with the camera in the closet. Cool. All right. Thank you. All right, Matt. Ready for your second question here, sir? Yes. What is your favorite photography destination? And what about that destination inspires you to come back or go back if you haven't been back? Um, I probably have to say currently right now it's uh, Grand Teton National Park. And that's uh, it's only four and a half hours away from me. Mm. Uh, I also lead uh, three different workshops out there every year, one in the spring, uh, usually one or two Milky Way workshops and a fall workshop. And I think it's just, um, you know, I'm originally from New England, and so we didn't have any mountains like this uh, back in the Northeast. So the the landscape out there is just so gorgeous. The you know the mountains, the 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 light that you can get out there is just absolutely amazing. And uh, it can also be a challenging place to photograph too, not getting the same old shots that everyone else has. Mm -hmm. So I like the challenge of the of the landscape and trying to find things different. Uh, under those great lighting conditions. And, you know, you got landscape, you got wildlife. So there's, there's a lot to choose from out there. So that's, that's my favorite right now. Cool. All right. So I'm being told that a lot of people can hear Tom and Lisa. I Hopefully can't. Can. So, <laughs> oh yeah. There you Woo. Look at there. Right out of the heaven. Oh, the technology. Oh, yeah, I've heard the swearing yet, have you? All right. Do you remember the question? Uh, I remember the first question, yes. So the first All question right. was related to the fact that we've been shooting lots of flowers. So we decided when we first were kind of stuck at home and we had to cancel all our trips to have a mind shift to being safe at home. And then we took it one step further to just saying, we're going to view this as our artist in residence period and do all this kind of creative photography that we never have the time to do, like water drops and flowers. And so basically every horizontal surface in our house is now a photography studio. The top of the dryer is for light painting. The kitchen table is where we do our light painting with our light pad box. I have a light tent on the dining room table. The other side of the dining room table has my time lapse. So we basically converted every single horizontal surface into photography studio. And we just said, we're going to make the best of this. We're going to do something every day. And when do we have the time like this to be able to be creative and 
yes, we miss traveling. Yes, we can't wait till it's safe to get out and travel again, but we weren't gonna let this. We heard some people say, we're taking the camera batteries out because we can't shoot for two months. And I said, no, don't do that. <laughs> Find something to shoot. So with the flowers, we found a local farm that was selling their eggs and milk. And then they said, well, we have flowers too. So it's contactless pickup. We just go, our name is on the box and we bring home all of these kinds of flowers and she's getting to know me now. Like today I called and she said, oh, we have cyclamens and we have you know, this. So she's getting to know, um, to be able to even let us know. And don't be afraid once the flowers start to wilt. So the first set of flowers I got, then they started to die. Tulips and other flowers are wabi-sabi and look awesome once they start to wilt and twirl up and all of that kind of stuff. So we've been having fun. Good. Good. Thank you, guys. Glad you could finally get on there with your audio. Yes. To hear that. Whoops, someone clicked the slides again. Here, let me get that. <laughs> Victor, next question's for you, Victor. You are an extremely creative photographer, but there have to be some days where you have a shoot and you aren't feeling the most creative that day. What do you do to ignite the creative spark in you on those days? Oh. Uh, <laughs> normally, you just turn up the music or whatever. I'm... I'm if there hasn't been very many shoots where I haven't been able to kind of get what I want out of them. Um, there was one time I was doing a model test and a model wasn't kind of cooperating. So I sent her home, but that's really the only time I've ever had any sort of issues. Um, for the most part, most of my shoots are pretty laid back. Everyone is uh, happy to be there. Some days do require a little more like coaching than others. Other days I can literally just put the model on set and they'll do every, you know, do their whole thing. And then I can pack up and go home in like an hour. So, um, but yeah, for the most part, we just, we listen to a lot of music. There's, there's not really, if I'm really struggling, I'll pull up images online and look at other people's work and see what's, uh, get, maybe something will click and get the, you know, get the gears going. Victor, you also shoot food photography and you've had some food up lately that looks good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, you enjoy cooking also. That's another creative outlet for you. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's kind of stress relief also. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not the best cook, but I enjoy kind of being in the kitchen and kind of uh, making up there. So. <laughs> Creativity. Yeah. Joe. Sorry, Sorry. I've been mostly lately these fat last couple shoots is because I've been practicing food styling. So that's why I've been kind of really taking it a little extra. It, well, it looks fantastic. I, yes, that lunch the other day, whatever that sandwich was, I'll take like <laughs> a dozen of those. Can you ship? <laughs> I'll, I'll try. No, <laughs> Thanks, Victor. Thanks. All right, Joe, now that you're live and, and uh, with us, as a wedding photographer, you capture one of the most important days in the lives of two people. Let, let our audience know what is going through your mind when you know those big moments are about to happen. Mm. Well, can you hear me? I just want to make sure. That yes. Works. Okay, yes. Um, well, you know, I... I guess that changes a bit over time, you know, uh, after doing about 700 weddings or so, it's a little bit different than it is the first time you do it. The, the really big moments, which you really are hoping for is that everything that's going on with your hands is just faded away in the background. And you're looking at the moment that's actually happening in front of you. And it's that kind of transparency that's really needed to make sure that you're capturing the real story of what's going on. Um, you know, I, I will, I'll tend to just, sit there and, and wait and watch and pick off moments as they're happening. I really love being in the background of those moments and not affecting them. I always tell people when I'm working a wedding, I really want you to know that I was there, but not really notice that I was there. And uh, I think that's critical to being a great documentary photographer. Cool. All right. Thank you, John. All right, John and Lisa, back to you. On your website, merrillimages.com, you offer photography tours in the Far East, like Vietnam and India, where you explore the Himalayan culture of Northern India. And it, we saw some of those images earlier. What is it about those two regions that draws you as photographers over and over again? That's a, a good question. I feel fortunate that we have been able to get 
at that far flung. And it, while we love, we also love Central and South America, the architecture, the food, I think with Vietnam, just like Cuba, there is that intense relationship our countries had with the country that, you know, from a historical, intellectual, and, and people to people is, is, is complex and we're always learning um, and we go humbly into them. But, you know, the, the mountains of the Himalayas meet both spiritual and nature needs. Like I can't wait to get back there. After 30 years, I was able to trek in Nepal last year and, you know, tra active travel and in the mountains is feels both of our souls. And for photographers, while you have the bustle of Kathmandu and the valley, in any country we mix city and nature. And it's it's just cities are great, but then it's nice to chill. And a lot of the people we work with want to do a mixture, and that is for us anywhere we explore. We love cities and culture, and then it's where's the mountains, the lakes, and let's breathe deep and get into nature photography, which lately has been more important to, I think, a lot of people in the world and on this panel. So what would you say? And I'd say that, um, you know, echoing what Lisa said about the spirituality of these places, it's, it's really, really interesting. Like when we go to the Himalayas, um, the only other place where I feel that way in the United States is like in the Grand, when we're rafting the Grand Canyon, it feels to me like a cathedral. And that's the same feeling I get when I'm when I'm there. And I'd say the, the other thing that is really stimulates my creativity when I'm in um, Asia is how friendly the people are, how colorful it is, and how different and strong the culture is there than it is here. And that for me, that stimulates my creativity. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you for sharing. I'm gonna go back to Tom and Lisa since well, that's we're thing I would just oh, go ahead. I just add the final thing is when we, we always say travel photography begins at home and we mean that. And in Seattle, many cities across our country, like I was, if I didn't fly, we lucky here, we have strong cultural festivals and it's also fuels our, our, our um, creativity and our souls. So that, you know, seek out where subcultures and cultures, wherever you are, if you want to get into that kind of storytelling and don't just wait for that once in a, long white lifetime, you know, splurge on a, in a Far East trip, because uh, we're lucky with the multicultural opportunities. So. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Back, Tom and Lisa, since you guys were kind of having some issues there earlier. If you had to pick one, just one Olympus feature that you wish more photographers would take the time to learn and understand, what would it be and why? I think it would be live composite, the thing that drew us to Olympus, because it is one of these things that it's like me telling you the water's warm. And until you put your hand in the water, you don't know it's warm. So I talked to people about live composite before I was Olympus shooter. I read about it and it was kind of like, mm, uh, well, yeah, fine. But when you see it happen and you're sitting there for a half an hour, normally looking at the back of a black screen on your camera and you're 30 seconds by 30 seconds or five minutes by five minutes seeing that image just refresh and seeing the histogram it, i mean is miraculous we were in arizona and we got permission to be in this junkyard at night and she said yeah you can come back my son lives here in the trailer so he came back about maybe 11 o'clock at night to check on us see what we were doing and tom was shining flashlights into these old trucks and the guy was a little stoned, so it was kind of an interesting reaction that he had. He's watching the back of Tom's camera. Tom goes over and he lights up one headlight, and the guy's like, whoa! And he goes over to the other headlight, lights up the headlight, and the Tom, the guy's still looking at the back of the camera. The guy's like, whoa! And I'm like, if we could have just taped his reaction when he was watching the live composite as a non-photographer even, I think everybody would just be like, oh my God, I, I, I need to jump onto this. I just want to point out, you know, working as a couple, we're, there are several couples here, you're very tight, you're very intuitive, and you almost, it, it's the yin and the yang. I, I like Steve and Faith, the way you guys process and look at pictures, and, and you always defer to the lady. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of fun. I always defer to the boss, you know? Um, but the reality is, is when you ask the question, Lee, that's a very good question. I was thinking live composite, too. 
<laughs> Not because you told me to say it, but because I was thinking it. <laughs> but I think it's one of those things that until you see it happen, you just don't, you can't understand that it's kind of like digital meets Polaroid. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's true. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, Joe, I'm going to hop back to you since you got you missed out a little bit there at the beginning. When there is a lot of activity going on at an event with a group of you know people, wedding, portrait, whatever it might be, <coughs> what do you do to help keep your focus on the action at hand that you need to be photographing? And that'll help wildlife photographers and others. So when there's lots of things going on, how do you find the image in the midst of the busyness? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I would say, what the best way to answer that? Let me think. Know your story. I think is the first one I would say. Um, and I always tell people that they need to pay attention. Like I'm always looking at the background of my images first and then at the foreground of my images, watching the corners of my frame. I think that's really important advice when you're watching a chaotic scene is that oftentimes I'm not even looking at what the subject's doing first. I'm watching how things are aligning up and watching how foreground background is working in to tell a story. And so finding those kind of moments, I think, are the most contextual, most storytelling things that you can do. And um, I also try to, when I'm working an event, try to shoot a huge variety of photographs. Um, that's why I'm often carrying two cameras and working with two different focal lengths and trying to give a variety of storytelling images all from the same moment. Okay, cool. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right, Leader, you ready? Yep. Yeah. Okay. What would you say to encourage a beginning photographer that you wish someone had said to you back when you began? Whew, there are any number of things that I learned the hard way. Um, one, I would say try to learn your craft before you get hung up on sort of the gear race. Um, any reasonably recent camera out there is going to be able to help someone learn photography. Um, I do teach a one-on-one -on -one class in Atlanta and um, I always tell my people, do not get hung up on who has what gear. Don't be jealous of those people. Learn your craft, practice. And um, you know, that's a load off your shoulders when you're not having to worry about that part of it too. So I think that's a good starting point. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. All right. I'm going to jump to Matt. Well, hold on here. Wait a second. I think okay. it's about time we have a question thrown your way again here. Okay. All righty. Fair enough. All right. So, Lee, you do some bird photography out there a little bit, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. So birds are uh, pretty interesting characters, and they can be some pretty fun subjects from time to time when they're behaving a little bit uh, mischievously. So you got one or two stories you can tell us where uh, you had some really unique encounters with the birds. Oh man, great bird photography encounters. Uh, yeah, and you had a photo of uh, some of the birds like right around the camera on the ground looking into the back yes. of the screen. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so I got to go to the Galapagos Islands uh, leading a workshop with co leading with Kevin at Wildside Nature Tours, a destination I truly never dreamed I'd get to go to. And because of a friend's unfortunate incident, it opened up the door for me to go. And I knew that there were a couple of birds there that I had envisioned based on other images I'd seen. And on one of the islands, the, the, the local mockingbird species will come right up to you, land on your bag, your head. And I knew before anybody else got off the boat, I wanted a shot of this bird up close before the sand was all messed up. So I scurry over and I'm one of those, I'll lay in mud, dirt, wet sand, whatever. I don't care for the shot. Lay down and, and sure enough, the bird comes right over. And, uh, and then a pair of them comes over and I took, and I believe it's the hood mockingbird if I remember off the top of my head. And I put an Olympus camera out in front of me and the birds walked up and they were checking the camera out. And then both of them, one's looking like the LCD screen, LED screen, and one's looking in the viewfinder and I snapped it. So it looks like, like one's looking at the shot and the other one's going, how did it turn out? So that was, that was a pretty cool experience. That one, that was a, a lot of fun. And then uh, also on the Galapagos, there is a spectacularly beautiful bird. I love birds that have crisp black, white, and gray plumage. And the swallowtail gull, uh, which is just a spectacular plumage bird, 
to get to when you get to the Galapagos, it's overwhelming. Birds are so close. It's like doing a wedding. Yeah, where do I shoot? Because there's so much around you. And for me, getting to photograph that bird numerous times in beautiful settings. I knew what I wanted before I got there. I wanted a nice black. I love black backgrounds. Some people don't like them. I love them. And I wanted that bird up against it. Sure enough, there's this beautiful rocky spot. It's in a, it's in a little bit of a hole, so a nice dark background. And and honestly, the Olympus gear is so incredible. I'd been shooting Canon for 20-something years. I would have never got either of those shots with a big 600-millimeter lens, having to have it on a tripod. It wouldn't have happened. So having a 300 on one hip with a 1.4, 40 to 150 with the two times on each hip, and then I had a third camera often on my back. I could lay there, get those shots. I would have never got a fraction of the shots I got because I didn't really talk about why I went to Olympus. I just moved to Olympus in the last year. Uh, literally, it's been almost a year ago today when I sold the big lens and went with the greater, and I've never looked back. So those are a couple of stories that really jump out with me with my Olympus gear that, you know, photographing owl monkeys on a skiff in the Amazon. All of our clients have big lenses. Their arms are getting tired, and I'm over there hand holding 840 millimeters in low light shooting owl monkeys that are very hard to see. And all of our, one of our clients got back. He had just bought his can of gear. He sold it. Next thing you know, he sends us a list of probably 15 to $20,000 worth of Olympus gear. Lee, I've ordered it. Good, good choice. Good choice. So thank you. That was a good question, man. I appreciate that. Well, and the follow up to that, I think everyone is dying to know is how uh -oh. much bird seed can you actually hide in that beard of yours to get the birds a little bit closer? <laughs> no, no. So this is a true story. This is a true story. I blacklight to catch insects for photography. And there's blister beetles, many species in the American Southwest that can really cause a problem. You have to be careful. Well, they'll fly down my shirt. So you're shaking shirts out and you're you're doing various things to try to be careful and so <laughs> I come inside and my wife's like, well, you know, what do you do about the blister bees? I said, well, if something gets in my beard, I just shake it out. And as I did this, a moth goes <laughs> off across the room. And I was like, well, see, there you go. They just hang out for a little while. So that was a great follow-up question because that is a true story that a moth flew out of my beard. That is true. <laughs> All right. Now back to you for a really good answer here. When you look at your Instagram account, aptly named Matt Seuss Photography, you see a broad variety of photography genres and you've been photographing since you were a young teen. And that's gotta be 50 or 60 years just looking at young teen. <laughs> what, is, what is a new technique, a new technique that you have learned in the past year or two and why is continually learning so important, so important in the development of a photographer at any level? Yeah. Yeah. When you do look at my uh, Instagram, uh, Matt Seuss photo, um, I do have a wide variety of subjects. Um, it is sort of geared towards landscape, but I also do wildlife and macro and a uh, whole lot of other different things. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned before I was a photojournalist for 17 years and being a photojournalist, you photograph everything and you have to be pretty decent at photographing everything. Sports, which I love photographing sports, um, portrait, um, everything. So um so yeah, I do have a wide base of things. And um, what was the second part of that, Lee? Why do you think it's important for a photographer at any level to keep learning? Oh yeah, geez, um, man, I am constantly learning. Uh, if you stop learning, I, I don't, I don't know if I would be enjoying what I was doing anymore if I wasn't learning anything. And you know, even though I have a lot of experience on what I did, I still learn. I learn from my students all the time. I mean, it's. Uh, one of the things that I love about workshops is learning from them and just seeing things in a different eye. So, you know, you're never too old to learn. You've, you're never too experienced to learn. If you are, you're doing the wrong thing at that point. And, um, you know, things that I've just learned even recently since switching over to Olympus is just how much more creative I can push myself. And that's where I'm really looking and doing really crazy different things. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at on that. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Jamie. All right. You shoot a lot of genres like I do, landscape, wildlife, night sky, some macro. But someone says you have to choose one of them, and that's all you can photograph from now on. Which one would it be and why? 
Oh man. Okay, so I'm just gonna say landscape, but only because it can encompass weather and astro. <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah. You know, That's I, I'm always that person when people ask, you know, what do you shoot? What what is your genre or whatever, you know? And I just say outdoor. I'm an outdoor photographer. I walk out my front door, everything's fair game. But if I had to nail it down, because Lee said, Jamie, you're only gonna go out and shoot one thing for the rest of your life, it's gonna be landscape. You know, it's it varies constantly. You can visit the same place every day for a year. Every day, it's going to look completely different. Even if you go back at the same time of day, day after day after day, you can get a completely different look constantly. Mm -hmm. There's just so much variety in it. And I couldn't imagine not having the opportunity to be outdoors photographing. So I'm just going to say landscape. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. I like that. All right, Joseph, you ready? Ready. All right. We see a lot of really crappy pictures on Facebook of families and family events and everything. Let's be honest. So give everybody two tips, just two tips that can make their images for family events, family, whatever it might be. Give them two things that we can see some better images on Facebook. Better images on Facebook. Um, okay, so tip number one would be uh, get some context. Like if you like one of the funny things that happens to me is like you're at a rehearsal dinner for a couple getting married and they're showing a slideshow of themselves growing up. And all it is is a revolving set of T-shirts. It's like, here we are with this T-shirt. Here we are in these T-shirts. And it just keeps going, going, going. And there's no it doesn't tell you anything about what was happening. So my first advice is that you need to have a camera around you enough when you're documenting your family that you can start to tell the story of where you were and what was going on. And so it requires taking more photographs, noticing more things, and trying to put some more of the story in your pictures. Don't be the parent that's always just taking the picture with a cell phone with the kids three feet away from you. And then the other thing that I see that is a real disadvantage of the cell phone culture that we have these days is that people oftentimes can't get close enough to the action. I find as a parent that I'm often photographing things that are far away from me, whether it's my kids playing soccer or they're on stage or they're at a recital or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons to carry a camera that's more capable, like our Olympus cameras, is that it gets you, you can get a telephoto lens and get closer to the action. And that will vastly improve your, your pictures as a parent in a lot of situations. How's that? Those are great. Actually, I can use those. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm making notes right now. <laughs> thank you, bud. All right, John and Lisa, besides having some great Olympus gear, how much time does proper post-processing play a role in the development of your images? You know, I think uh, for us, when we're traveling, we are so um, visually drained at the end of the night. We do a quick look, but we do a lot of it after. Um, we help people, of course, but, you know, and we like to photograph at night, too. So some people come back with everything. You know, we can barely share 10 with our family or so. It takes a bit of time. Um, but in general, I think um, we we love Lightroom. We don't, we just getting into Topaz for some of the drone and some high ISO stuff. But Lightroom's been our thing. We're not as anywhere near as technical in Photoshop as most of our peers here. And we love um, a crop and some exposure. We'll play around with the selects for a client, a slideshow, family, but to a, to a degree. And it's I always we always tell people like that can come later. Just like um, someone else was saying, don't get all the fancy gear. I'd say work on if you know every one of us getting things as well as we can in camera, and then you know the tools you can use later can really enhance and help images. Pop. One teacher once told us, you are the lab. And whether your tool is your high performance Olympus or, you know, a computer, there is some enhancements that we enjoy doing. So. Yeah. And I, and I add to that, you know, I mean, the most important thing we do in post is edit, right? We get rid of, you know, we, we edit in a couple different rounds. We get rid of the garbage, you know, which inevitably you get. And then you focus on the really good stuff we, we do star ratings um we focus on the really good stuff and spend our time only on the really good pictures and that, that makes sense in terms of efficiency and, and um, you know how our workflow can be can be um 
minimum amount of time where we have more time to be out shooting. Or doing other stuff. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Back to Tom and Lisa. Okay. Yep. What is an often overlooked skill that is critical to the success of being a good outdoor photographer or indoor? And how can photographers develop this skill? I think it's slowing down and being patient. Can you hear us? Okay. I think you can't, but everybody else can. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, you can hear them? Yeah. Okay. So I think it's slowing down and being patient. Sometimes we'll go to a, a spot with some workshop people and we're going to be there for four hours or eight hours and 20 minutes in, they're like, okay, been there, done that. Um, and they're ready to leave. And it's taking those slowing down and in our fast paced society, just to have an excuse to slow down is nice, but to slow down and work it and figure out what attracted you to stop and photograph that particular subject to begin with. So I think it's that I would tell people slow down, really work your subject. And we actually do a program even called working it where we just show examples of maybe what attracted us at first thought to a landscape or a tree or something isn't what the final picture ended up because we worked it and we kept working it. So it's just slow down and, notice and, and work it. Somebody needs to tell Lee now that I stopped talking. <laughs> You're good? Okay, perfect. I couldn't hear a thing, so thank you for the heads up. Appreciate it. Okay. All right, Victor, you're up. Your third question. All right. What one or two life experiences most influenced or shaped your personal photography style? What one or two life experiences most influenced or shaped your personal photography style? Um, huh. That's a that's kind of a tough question. Um, this is proof that we didn't get questions ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> Truth. Uh, one or two life experiences. Um, well, I know. I guess some one thing that kind of influenced like the uh, like kind of the style that I'm, I'm into has to do with, uh, I guess now growing up in the military and living in Europe uh, most of my childhood. Um, so I had a lot of that, that kind of influenced uh, the way I think and the way I see things. Um, and I guess another thing, uh, honestly, another thing that kind of shaped it was uh, as cheesy as it might sound, is, is actually being involved with Olympus, um, like meeting them while I was in school. And, you know, you know, when I was in school, that's like, you have all your professors that's telling you you're awesome. But then when you have outside people telling you you're awesome, it's kind of what, you know. Motivates you. Motivates you, yeah. Keep and going. Then, and, and try and try and do better than what you did last time. Yeah, exactly. So I had a lot of that, and um, uh, getting to us be an assistant for people like Lois Greenfield, like people that I've looked up for to, uh, also kind of helped influence a lot of how I my style. Um, I also sometimes assist for uh, a wedding photographer, which I'm not a wedding photographer myself, but I learned a lot from over the years working with her. Um, and so that's another thing that's kind of helped shape my style. And, and we're also studio mates, so we share the same studio. So it kind of works out. So cool. All right. Thank you, sir. That's cool. Thank you, sir. All right. Faith and Steve, third question. What feature on the newer Olympus bodies has made the biggest difference in your overall approach to photography? Oh, the new, the new feature that we're super excited about on the EM1 Mark III is that starry, uh, starry sky autofocus. Um, we enjoy one of the places we, we've been recently, even since quarantine, we had to go shut down our camp. Um, so we have a, a camper that we park on public land um, permitted during open season, but um, we had to go move it recently and to be able to get out there and see the night sky. We live in Tampa, um, which is a, a, quite a populated city. Um, so we have terrible light pollution here, um, but when we can get out um, to uh, the campsite out in um, another darker area of Florida, um, that's been amazing to get to try out. Was there another feature? Um, I think the in-body 
camera stabilization is huge. I, From it, our previous it, camera it, system, it, absolutely. It stuns us, as the capabilities of that. Like we are shooting handheld, you know, two seconds is not off the two, chart. Two seconds, Steve's gotten some that We've were gotten four as slow seconds as four handheld. seconds handheld, which yeah. you would never attempt that in any other camera system. And we've owned many, we have many camera systems. We sell well, cameras, we own cameras. We've worked in camera stores for all years. Our lives, so, so when you talk about, you know, gear buy any camera. gear envy and you want to see all the new stuff come in, but really um, of all the camera systems that we have opportunity to, to play with. And I mean, on a daily basis, all day. To, to see the features in the Olympus system, um, um, what they offer, the in-body image stabilization, focus peaking. Um, from here to the monitor, I can see fine, but if I have to look past this monitor, I'm wearing eyeglasses. The focus peaking for me on telephoto end was huge. That was a big deal. And the live comp feature is something I think a lot of us um, that have, have enjoyed playing with. Live comp was the sell for me. Our, our rep that came into the store showed a demo with a little slideshow presentation, light coming through the box and, and the camera was able to create um, these amazing uh, fireworks displays. So you're watching it happen on the screen. It's just uh, uh, stunning. And, and that's totally what, what uh, won us over. And, and the compact size, I mean, I, I we are surrounded by, you know, the, the full framers, but it, it, to us, the, the, the margin, the difference of what you have to carry for the margin of difference of a bigger resolution. If, if you shoot it accurately, you have plenty of latitude um, in the Olympus system to, to be able to finesse your images to what you're looking for and to be able to carry the camera all day and everywhere. Another place that we enjoy going a lot, we live in Florida, so we have um, annual passes to Disney. So we'll go there all the time, maybe a couple, you know, a couple times in a week. Um, so to be able to carry a camera there all day, um, so much easier with the Olympus system. And, you know, you, there's so many lenses to choose from as well that really enhance the, the options on it. So like Jamie was saying, like EM1X and 12 to 100, that's what I shoot I'd most of the that. time. But that. if I'm going to Disney and I know I'm going to the Food and Wine Festival, I might pick something that maybe is my Pen F with a 17 because that's more appropriate for that situation. And I know I'm going to be carrying, you know, other things with it all day. So, um, yeah, definitely. Matt, Matt Sue says the 40 to 150 2.8 is crazy sharp. Yeah, definitely. Um, the the um, camera system, though, we, we've just had such fun with it. Um, we We... Um, we're, we're at a tipping point of, of replacing gear and, and the Olympus system definitely sold us over. So we've been shooting Olympus since 2016 um, with the release. Uh, yeah, 20, uh, I think well, it was we had September about 2012, 2016. actually. We had the oh. original L oh, EPL-1. Yeah, we EPL-1. Well, before that, if we yeah, count film. film cameras, yeah, uh, yeah. But um, yeah, EPL-1, I loved the, <laughs> the color mode on it. So that was one that I'd, I'd shoot a lot at Disney because of the, the cartoonish kind of colors. Um, and then, yeah, the when the Pen F came out, that was the camera that won us over. So The gateway drug there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The gateway camera. We all so have that, don't we? How many Olympus <laughs> users um, are using Pen F? Like, yeah. show of hands of people on the screen right now. Yeah, yeah. You have one, right? So you might shoot, you know, other cameras for different situations. But, man, that Pen F is so much fun to play with. It is the sexiest camera. It is, it is. Very, <laughs> the I, lens quality. I call that my dress up camera. If I'm traveling, that goes in the bag. It's my fancy going out to dinner camera. That's, yeah, 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 that's yeah. a dinner camera. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. That's cool. Yeah. All right. I've got one for Leader that this is going to challenge you. I think this will be uh, fun. If you like go shoot, she loves math. Yeah. <laughs> what else? <laughs> If you could go shoot with any one photographer, alive or dead, oh, God. who would it be and why? Or if there isn't any one person, what period of time, even if there weren't cameras in existence, would you like to go back and shoot? Pick one or the other. You can't pick us, Lee Dress. Sorry, you got to pick somebody else. Well, I used to like you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. No, that's true. Well, Jerry was out. No. Well, uh, push. The grief, man. I, I I don't know. So I can't, there's really no one person that I would uh, necessarily want to go shoot with um, that I can think of uh, quickly. 
Um, a hundred when she's off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, yeah. No, I'll be texting you back all night. Oh, um, and this one and this one. <laughs> yeah, I wake up at four in the morning. I'm like, ah. Oh. oh, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I oh, mean. Oh. So, what about a period of time? Well, they have a period of time. I mean, I guess if I could take a camera back to those periods of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I anything that uh, I think turn of the century would be kind of interesting. N not this century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. yeah, we're getting older. It's not not this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 20 years is not a big deal. But, uh, you know, I guess 19th century, go back and um, again, again, like some of the trips some of you guys are doing is, you know, later than that, like Cuba is almost going back to what, the 40s or something like that. Some of those trips. Yeah. Or whatever. But So that would be kind of cool. But I, I just that's a. Um, that's a hard question, Lee. I think that'd be a great time period, man. Yeah. Like, that's it's it's oh, give us the image stabilization, though. I want the same features. Oh, to go can back you imagine? <laughs> I don't need a horse yeah. to carry my camera. You would look like a witch or something. Like, a, I'm a sure, they would burn you at the stake at that point. Oh, yeah. I'd be yeah. with this horse. look. Are you kidding me? I could look. I could, you know. It's amazing what they did 100 years ago. <laughs> it is. I can't All believe right, Joe, back to you. We I asked you a question earlier and you didn't really you you know at that time you couldn't chime in. We were talking about your YouTube channel and Jamie threw that up for us and I think Lisa did too. What when you are filming your videos, what is it that's motivating you to help improve others' photography? What's motivating you? Uh, well, it's probably twofold. The first one is that uh, like a lot of us on screen mm. right now are entrepreneurs. And when you're an entrepreneur, you're often like, separated from people a lot. You know, you don't have that sort of water cooler experience in your life where you're collaborating every day with people. And so I saw the YouTube channel as a way to uh, engage with lots of other photographers. And that's really what it's afforded me from my perspective. The thing that I love is just uh, getting to know other photographers and helping them. And then when it comes to the photography itself, you know, uh, I have a real passion for people photography for, and that's why I shoot weddings and families because I believe in those moments being such an important part of our lives. And if I can help a photographer get to the next level in that game and make photographs that are meaningful history of their family, then I think it's totally worth doing. Cool. All right, guys. Well, that's the questions I had for tonight. I hope you've got a chance to now kind of get an introduction. We'll definitely be doing more webinars. I'm sure some of these folks will be doing some on their own. So if you don't follow their social media, that's going to be the best way to stay up to date with the classes, the, the, the software uh, related products they produce, the YouTube videos, the workshops, uh, the portrait shoots, the commercial work. So make sure to sign up if you're an Olympus shooter for sure. If you're not, if you're looking into it, and you're interested in one of the, the types of photography that these folks do, shoot them the questions. I promise you, in the, in the amount of time I've gotten to know these folks, they are more than happy to help. They are very knowledgeable. We have camera store employees. We've got folks who've been photographing since they were teens, people who go all over the world, some who stay near home. There is a great chance that you will get the answers you're looking for. Someone said, show us the dog. My bulldog is letting the <laughs> hovelings in the yard know that this is his place. So I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, can the attendees write in what write in webinars that they would oh. like to see us a limited yeah. yeah. present? Great idea. Yes, if you have ideas for sure. webinars you would like to hear from us on yeah. specific equipment, how to use that equipment for specific types of photography, please send us those messages. We get together regularly and we'll share those, and that will help us develop our next webinar. So again. Yeah. I'm going to say good night, guys. Thank you for chiming in tonight. I appreciate thank all you. the time and input. You. Guys, thank go you. out. And, like they said, just go shoot and learn yes. and go attend and learn from these folks. Y'all have a good evening. It's been a pleasure. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Thanks for joining us.